Welcome to Green Gotham. I'm Lou Blaustein. Thanks for watching us. And a particular thank you goes out to Green Gotham viewer Claire Summer from New Jersey, who shared via our Facebook page about how she is helping to make business more sustainable in the Garden State. So thank you, Claire. On this side of the Hudson, making business more sustainable, is our guest, and that is Michael Deutsch, partner and CEO of Fourth Bin, a company that is involved in the business of e-waste or electronic waste recycling. Michael, thank you for joining us. Welcome thank to you. Green Gotham. Thank you for having me. So quick definition, what do we mean when we say e-waste recycling? Uh, so e-waste recycling is the process of recycling electronic waste, which is computers, monitors, printers, it could be um, various appliances in your home, it could be microwaves and toasters, uh, but more often than not, it's, it's computer equipment. And do you see a growth in this industry over the last, let's say, five years? Mm -hmm. The industry has grown tremendously. Um, it's grown, I guess, in terms of volume that companies like Fourth Bin are seeing, uh, which is partly due to awareness and awareness growing, not just here in New York City, but just nationally. Uh, with various legislation across different states raising awareness and so people are getting more involved and um, becoming more knowledgeable about how to recycle their e-waste. So we're seeing it that way and as, as a whole the industry is actually projected to grow substantially over the next five years. Well that's a good business to be in. Now speaking of awareness, associate producer from Green Gotham Jennifer, Jennifer Ortiz and I went out earlier in the summer to Central Park and we did man and woman in the street interviews talking to folks about whether they e-waste recycle, whether they even know about it. So let's cue the clip. What do you guys do when you're done with using a cell phone or an iPhone, an iPad or a television or any bit of electronics? What do you do? It's done. I just throw it away. Had, are you guys aware of in, in, in Tennessee where y'all are? Do they have e-waste recycling? Yeah, are, are you aware of that in where you all live? Yeah, I've seen like small advertisements for it. And in India, do they also have an e-waste recycling program where they actually, where people who aren't as you know, uh, uh, charitable as you might want to throw it out, but instead they give it to a recycling place who will handle it in, in an environmentally friendly manner? Honestly, it's comparatively new there, yes. so it's picking up. In Canada, do they have a recycling program for uh, electronic waste or what we call e-waste? Uh, they do. If I was to tell you that by throwing this stuff away, it's, it's really bad for the environment. Ba what ends up happening is it, it goes to, to places in sub-Saharan Africa or Southeast Asia and you know, people for minuscule money you know, handle it and try and do stuff with the elements inside and it's very toxic. So the having it you know, kind of dissembled in, a, in an environmentally friendly and certified way is much, much better. Would that maybe make you or encourage you to say, hmm, maybe I'll e-waste recycle? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. There are like electronic garbages where you can go just drop your old hard drives and stuff. I don't know what they do with them, but I've seen them. Would you consider doing that once you're ready to not keep the stuff that you're not using? I might be lazy sometimes and just throw it. It's easy to just throw it away. So, we got a mixed bag there. Yes. Uh, it sounds like a lot of people aren't thinking too much about it. And yet, awareness maybe on the macro level is mm -hmm. growing. Where, what's that dichotomy about? Um, I think the dichotomy is about um, where you're raising awareness is coming from, um, often from government programs. Uh, they have acknowledged, at least here in New York, that they haven't done a good enough job raising awareness there. So while some people and the people that are in tune with it, um, and there's a very large sustainability movement here in New York City, those people often know 
what to do and how to do it and what the issues are. Um, past that, the average person is probably not aware of what goes on. Um, the average person, from, from my experience, isn't even fully aware of how to recycle regular materials. Um, right, with the recycling bins, right. the blue bins, most people get, many that's people right. get confused about right. what to throw in there and what not. That's right, it's very confusing and for years we've been told um, here are the materials that New York City or New York State will recycle and it's you know your typical waste and there's your, your, your paper and cardboards and plastics but no one thinks about anything past that. Um, so I think that's where the issue and the dichotomy comes from is the average person isn't thinking about everything else that they're holding and how it can be or should be recycled or what goes into making them uh, except for the people that are, are, are in the know in the sustainability world or keep in touch with government, government legislation or government programs. Well, well, we'll get back to how we can increase that number in, sure. a, in a bit. But I want to go a little bit back into your history mm -hmm. because it is intriguing to me how you who were in the finance world and the tech world, the tech world yeah. uh, how you got from that into e-waste recycling. So maybe you could tell us that story. Sure. Uh, so prior to starting Forthbin, my partner John and I, actually both of us, came from the tech world. We spent over 10, uh, I'm sorry, over 15 years in the tech industry uh, doing everything from help desk and hands-on engineering through management, senior management, sales. I mean, this is combined experience. Uh, so we'd actually had these experiences of how do you get rid of materials before we knew that there was a way of getting rid of the materials. My personal experience was I was actually running uh, an IT division for a large financial institution and we had equipment coming off lease. They were about three years old and they were sitting in a room taking up space and I wanted to donate them to a charity, a nonprofit, and they wouldn't take it. They would tell, they would tell me that really? it's three years old and they want something a year or less. And I explained to them that I'm, I'm a financial institution, the equipment that I have is high powered, high-end equipment, it's probably just as good, if not better, than what you've got or what you want, uh, and they still refused. That was just one example. I mean, further past that, I ended up calling other organizations to try and have this stuff taken care of and recycled. Now I know more about it, but at the time, they weren't probably not going to be recycled the way that we think about it. Um, they wanted to charge an incredible amount of money just to take the materials away. So did you see therein a business material? I mean a business, a business opportunity? At that time, no. Um, that was about 10 years ago. So really where we saw the business opportunity was about six years ago uh, when John, my partner John Kirsch and I, uh, we got into a conversation. At the time, John was working for a technology consulting company and they were running um, a marketing event for some of their clients. There were architecture and creative design firms and they had asked these firms to create an electronic waste bin. Um, and so there was a big marketing event going on with this, within this organization. And John and I got to talking on the side one day. Uh, he'd mentioned this to me and we started talking about how it's really challenging to try and um, dispose of e-waste, you know, electronics, in New York City because New York City presents a lot of issues. There's logistic issues and getting in and out. There's regulations, there's uh, more than anything else, it's really the logistics issues um, because we don't have loading docks. It's hard to drive trucks in and out. People commute mass transit. They don't bring vans and trucks and cars. And so how do you get materials out to a recycling center to drop them off? Um, so it's really challenging if someone wants to do something with them, especially doing the right thing with them. And that's where we sort of realize that there is an opportunity to do the right thing uh, and to create a, a process to help people and companies dispose of and recycle their equipment. So when you say the right thing. The right thing. The right thing. What do you mean by the right thing? What is the right way? Or probably there are several right ways, several things yes. that go into being the right way. What is the yes. right way to dispose of cell phones and computers and et cetera, et cetera? The right way um, from a consumer perspective, I would say the right way is to work with a reputable company know who you're working with. Um, view them not as the cheapest vendor that you can find, but as a partner, because you want them to provide something for you. And But what does that mean? Like, what do they do that the mm -hmm. unreputable or right. disreputable ones don't? What makes it right? That's what I'm trying to get out. Mm -hmm. What makes it right? So the, the main differentiator between companies that want to do and try to do the right thing and the other companies are certifications in the industry. 
which are, are not required, they're optional, and when a company undertakes that, you're being independently audited on an annual basis uh, to prove that you're following higher standards within the industry. If a company can't demonstrate that, then what standards are they holding themselves to? And you have no way of knowing that without that certification. And how long have the certifications been around? The certifications have been around, I would say, probably about seven or eight years. So this would be, in essence, Maybe. the good housekeeping seal, or to make it more yes. green, the lead version, That's right. in, uh, the lead of e-waste re recycling. That's right. That's and right. so the, when you are adhering to the standards, what does that mean downstream mm -hmm. for the people who are taking this stuff apart and where they're taking it apart? Sure. Um, so downstream literally means down the stream. It's all the vendors who take that, who may touch that equipment from the point that it leaves your hands until it hits um, it, it hits final disposition. It hits the you know it could be the smelter where they're they're melting it down into raw commodities. And there's a lot of players that could touch all of this stuff from the from the time it leaves you until it hits the commodities market at the end. Um, the key to it all is is um, how the materials are being recovered and how they're actually getting the materials out of the different equipment that you're sending them, the CRT monitors or the computers, how do they recover those metals or those plastics? And the CRT, that stands for cathode ray tubes, yes. which would be the old style television. That's right, the big heavy. And in particular, heavy. those are um, those are big problems. Not yes. only are they big physically, but they're big problems. What makes CRTs in particular problematic? CRTs have been around for decades and decades. Um, the old style televisions that are dating back into you know, 40s and 50s, if you think about how many different makes and models and shapes and sizes and weights there were of all of these CRTs, not the CRTs that sit on your desk, but those are included for, for your, your monitors, your computer monitors that sat on your desk for 20 years, uh, and how many makes and models there were of those, that's the issue, is how do you automate a process to open those up and recover the materials out of there? The big issue with a CRT, uh, or one of the biggest issues with a CRT in terms of hazardous materials is the amount of lead that's in a CRT monitor or a CRT TV. Uh, it's about 25% of its weight is lead, which is a very large amount of lead in one individual item. So how do you, how do you um, properly recover that without leaking any of that material out or without having any issues with with the recovery process it's impossible to automate and so, and so that's a high cost yes and so a high time that's right kind of operation and then are you the people who are handling the lead where are they typically in the world is this something that's happening in the US or could it be in you know undeveloped or countries where the standards again using that word standards are not so strict um, it actually happens in both. The problem is that it, the CRTs don't always make it to the CRT recycling centers because it is an expensive process. A lot of the organizations that are out there that do e-waste recycling choose to offload that expense. So often what you see, and this is the big in industry issue right now, is CRT stockpiling. So what companies will do is they'll take the CRTs in and they'll store them, hoping that either pricing for um, properly handling these materials comes down at some point in the future or something is going to happen to change their fortunes for the expense there. And what they do is they stockpile. Uh, we've seen huge examples within the last year of facilities in different states. Even in upstate New York, there was a facility that shut down. And when they went in afterwards, this is an e-waste recycling facility, and when they went in afterwards, they found tons and tons and tons of CRTs stockpiled there. And then, and then it becomes uh, either a landlord issue who doesn't have any experience in recycling, or a state issue, or a city issue, depending on who takes ownership of that facility. And so that's a huge issue. And so the standard setting that went on, and then the standard organizations, which mm -hmm. would be, I believe, e-stewards and R2. R2, are those, what percent of recyclers, and you don't have to give an exact answer, but what percentage of recyclers are living up to those standards, would you say? What percentage are actually certified? Yes, are certified. 
Um, I don't have an exact percentage that, that are carrying certifications from both, um, or either, I should say. I would say that the vast majority of recyclers across the country are not certified, um, mostly because they're probably not true recyclers. Um, our industry finds itself with people calling themselves recyclers, which is a word that can be very used very loosely, um, but companies like waste management companies who are not recyclers, they're waste management When you're companies. talking about, when you, are you talking about literally the company waste management with the green trucks <laughs> or, or? Waste management also does e-waste recycling. Yeah. Um, they actually have a pretty decent process, um, okay. but I'm talking about the industry as a okay. whole waste management Just to be industry. clear for yes. our viewers. Yes. Now, the waste management companies are garbage companies, essentially. Right. Um, and you'll find trucking and hauling companies, which are also a variation of, of garbage companies. You'll find scrap metal companies located all around the city, you'll find some in the city, you'll find some in Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx, uh, who open up a subsidiary and calling themselves, you know, e-waste recycling companies and they go out there and, and at the end of the day they're not really qualified to handle all of, all of the materials that come their way. So then how do you as Fourth Bin, who is, mm -hmm. who is certified, who does the right thing, yeah. how do you compete with these folks who are not? And what is your kind of business model for reaching the people who care about this stuff? Right. So the way that we compete is on various levels. Um, first of all, we've been around a bit longer than everyone else has, so we have a bit of a, a brand equity in the market here. So people know us, and they know what we stand for. Um, and being the only East Steward recycler that's owned and operated out of New York City certainly helps a lot to demonstrate our credentials. Um, we are, you know, the, one of the big differences between Fourth Bin and, and all of these other organizations is that John and I don't come from this industry. We come from technology. Technology and the flip side. And we were the people sitting on the other end of the desk. So a lot of what our customers experience now is what we wanted to experience when we were on the other side. So incredible, high, incredibly high levels of customer service. Uh, it's really high touch. That's what it's meant to be. Um, we focus on things that we know well, data security. I mean, I spent, again... That's a whole other issue. It's, that's a whole I mean, other we've issue. We've been focusing yes. on the environmental mm -hmm. aspects of this and disposition in a, an environmentally healthy way. Yeah. But sh share a little bit about the data aspects of this. Well, I mean, we're seeing huge amounts of, of hacking issues going on. Um, the federal government's been hacked. Every large, day there's a new so, story about Every day there's a new story. Sony's been hacked. Major corporations have been hacked. Hacking is not just, is not the only data security issue that's out there. Imagine if people physically had access to your hard drive with your data. And that's what happens when you work with companies that are not reputable, that don't have any processes in place to protect your data. You don't know what's going to happen with that because some people that you don't know that you've never verified have credentials to handle that or that you know where the material is going to go, we're going to be handling that material. So people physically have access to your data, so what do you do about that? The key is working with reputable companies, wiping the data, have them wipe it for you, provide certifications. I mean, the data security industry itself is an enormous undertaking and is an enormous task in an organization. And so do you see your customers coming to you as well, we're greenies and we want to do the right thing, or we're really concerned about the security aspects of it, or a, a mixture of both. We get both. Actually, we get we get um, people concerned with sustainability. Um, we work with a lot of sustainability professionals in corporations. We get residential customers um, in New York City that uh, know what Fourth Bin does and n know that. Working with Fourth Bin is a guarantee that, that the sustainability aspect of it is being adhered to from an ethical perspective. We get customers that are concerned about finances as well um, because there's other programs. Ideally, they're concerned with both. Yes, yes, ideally they're concerned with both, which is part of the challenge because the unethical people will typically undercut the ethical companies like Fourth Bin. It's not just Fourth Bin, but obviously there are other companies that carry certifications that do the right thing. Um, and the, uh, companies like Fourth Bin typically tend to be a bit more expensive than other organizations that are out there that don't have the same cost structure that we do because they don't care about the proper processes. Right, they're not here adhering to the standards right. and incurring the cost that adhering to those standards means. That's right. So let's say I'm a medium-sized business. Mm -hmm. I have 100 employees and I'm churning through 
computers and I'm churning through cell phones and I'm churning through other electronics. My, how do I find out? You know, where do I go for information that makes this sensible, easy to understand, and then hopefully in your case leads me to fourth bin? Uh, I think there's a lot of different ways. Most people, I would guess, probably Google everything. Um, and that's the easiest place to get all of the information. Um, New York State has legislation, um, and they list recyclers and collectors and consolidators as different categories within New York State. And they list most of the organizations that are registered within the state, so you could typically find companies that can do it for you. The problem with that, though, is that they don't tell you whether they have certifications or not. So you might get a list of 50 recyclers, and only one might carry a certification. Why don't they? Why don't they carry certifications? Why, why, no, why don't they list that? They should list that. Because it's not state required. And that's um, because there's not the state laws, which it, it sounds, you know, it sounds like there's kind of a patchwork of laws state to state. Yes. It's not, there's not a standard of the standards, right? That's right. That's right. There's no, currently there's no federal le legislation on the books. Would you um, like to see that? Would, that? would that be good for you and for Fourth Bin? I think it would be good for everyone. Um, you know, what we need are we need some standards in the industry um, so that it levels the playing field for the, the, um, the ethical companies, the companies that are trying to do the right thing and absorbing those costs. And, uh, you know, it gives the guys who don't do the right thing an unfair advantage from a financial perspective. You know, it's always easier to say, I'd like to give my stuff to someone for free. They're willing to come pick it up for free, but if they're not going to do the right thing with it, is it really free? Right. Um, and so from, a, from a, a legislation perspective, there's no federal standard. The standards are state by state, and every state has their own variation. Um, there's, no, there's no two states that are really alike. Um, there are similarities between states, of course. It sounds like we need federal legislation. But, yeah, but, but there's, they, they vary state by state. Is this, is, is this an issue that is getting more traction? And maybe there's not a you know, a, a metric for this, but that your sense of it, mm -hmm. that it's getting more traction both with the public, with, you know, the powers that be at state and federal level, um, because it seems like just my, my sense of it is that it's still not a high, a high res issue, so to speak. Yeah, you know, it's, um, it's gotten some traction. There are organizations like NRDC. Great um, organization. Great organization who have championed the e-waste cause both here in New York and on a federal level. Um, but then it tends to get overlooked when big issues like fracking arise. So fracking becomes the big issue of that day and e-waste kind of, you know, it's, under the rug a little bit. It's so, not as sexy, so to it's speak. It's not as sexy. It's not, and it's not. <laughs> it's not However, as, when you see, uh, <clears throat> And I saw the fellow from E. Stewards and Basel uh, Action Network, Jim Puckett, Jim Puckett mm -hmm. give a presentation that yeah. was compelling, where yeah. it shows people handling e-waste without gloves in, yeah. you know, in I think in uh, it was in Thailand and also in sub-Saharan Af Africa, and it was just horrible the diseases that these people were yeah. were coming down with, and is that something that you and John are also communicating to the people who you may be, you know, who may be your customers. Yeah, you know, the, the challenge of speaking with a lot of our customers, especially in the corporate world, is you don't know what their motivator is. So uh, we speak with people whose main motivator is security, data security, and right. they don't care as much about the environmental the stuff environmental or the human cost. Or the human cost. Uh, some people are purely motivated by finances and don't care about either the data security or the 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 environmental impact. Um, so it's it's often a challenge for us to try and explain what the true environmental impact is. And you know, you mentioned overseas, but it's not just overseas where there's environmental impact. It's here as well. And this is something that that the standards help here in the the certification standards because um, everything from to not just toxic fumes from incineration. If you try to burn this equipment, you can imagine what kicks up into the air. Right. But simple things like taking apart these monitors also releases chemicals. Uh, dealing with toner, I don't know if you've ever opened a toner cartridge or ever got yes, toner on your yes, hand. Yes, yes, yes. Can you imagine breathing that stuff in? So All day. All day, and there are companies that specialize in toner recycling. And if they're not following good standards, there are people that are working there that are breathing this in day in and day out that get very sick. 
it's actually, air quality is a huge component of both the R2 and eSteward standards to make sure that the air quality for the employees, the people that are working there, is good for them, good for them to work in, otherwise it becomes a toxic environment. So now as you see in your own crystal ball, the business for fourth bin and the e-waste recycling business writ large, mm -hmm. You know, where do you see it in the next three to five years? And what could make it a game changer? What could be a game changer that could get this to be a high res issue? Um, from a business perspective, we see the industry growing. And there have been projections that the industry is supposed to grow by something like $20 billion within the next five years, which is a huge number. Um, that is huge. That is huge. Uh, the good side of that, of course, not just for the businesses that are in there, but the good side is that it, that means that awareness is being increased. And people, more people are just, dis, uh, you know, are e-waste recycling. That's right. So instead of it just going to the curb where sanitation is taking it and it's going to a landfill or something like that, it's actually getting funneled into the system somehow. Uh, the problem is, is you have a lot of those guys who don't necessarily do the right thing. Um, and all of this is all dependent upon commodities markets. Um, so as the commodities markets rise and fall, you have more players or less players because they get squeezed out when the markets are smaller because when the, when the commodities market is smaller because they can't, they're not recovering as much money off these equipment. So big picture, what we hope to see over the next couple of years is um, a shrinking of the, some of the players in the market, of course, especially the unethical players. Uh, and we are seeing some consolidation now and we'd love to see some, some uh, federal legislation and tweaks to the state and even local legislations that are out there. Well, that would be great. I got one important question, <laughs> and that is, where did the name come from, Fourth Bin? <laughs> it came from the fact that in New York City we have, we don't have bins, so I guess we do have bins, right. um, but we have three garbage streams. So there's your regular waste stream, there's your papers and cardboard, and there's your glass and, and plastics. And so John and I came up with the concept of Fourth Bin, which is electronic waste as an additional stream of, of recycling. Well, that is a great name. Thank you. Fourth bin, hopefully in first place in e-waste recycling. And Michael, thank you, thank you so much for educating us and for the work that you and John and the folks at Fourth Bin do to increase properly disposed of electronic waste. To the viewers out there, we would love to hear your stories of whether you're e-waste recycling, how you're doing it, and if not, why not? Just join us on our Facebook page and, and continue the conversation there. Thank you for watching, and see you again next time on Green Gotham.